Okay, folks, let me uh, let me say a couple words about the next uh, upcoming homework. Um, I, I sort of teased you with this a little bit. Now I kind of put my money where my mouth is. So the first part, I want you to give an example. Uh, give an example of our modules, A, B, and C, where B is isomorphic to A and C, and yet this thing does not split. Remember, if it's split exact, then the middle is the direct sum of the ends. However, the converse is not true in general. I will give you a hint that you'll need to look at the modules that are not finite degenerate. They have to be big, because actually, if A, B, and C are finite degenerate, this does work out. Uh, number two, uh, this is another one that I kind of gave you as a tease. Show that uh, the short exact sequences are the building blocks of all other exact sequences in the following sense. Suppose I walk up to you on the street and give you any sort of long exact sequence that you want. Show that you can build this by splicing together um, appropriate short exact sequences, right? Uh, Remember, of course, what this means is this map, the image of this is the kernel of this. And so those will play in the short exact sequences that you know us. Number three is another example. So I guess this home looks a little bit example heavy. Um, and this one's kind of a little too weird for color TV, I think. And this shows you how strange things can get. And yet another reason why I like rings of identity and so forth. Let F be a field, any field you like, and be a vector space of countably infinite dimension over F, right? So, you know, this is something that might not be too far built from a linear algebra class, right? So, countably infinite uh, vector space, V over F. Now, I will let the ring R be the home F from V to V. So, this is just the set of linear transformations. From this infinite dimensional vector space to itself. This is a ring, right? Because uh, I add two functions point wise, right? And my multiplication is just going to be function composition, right? Because f goes from v to v, g goes from v to v, their composition goes from v to v. Everybody okay with that? Um, right. So show that uh, as a left module over itself, R is actually isomorphic to any number of copies of R as a module, right? That is really weird, right? That means that R is isomorphic to two copies of R, it's isomorphic to three copies of R, and so forth and so forth, right? As a module. That's kind of weird, isn't it, right? But this shows kind of the hazard. Let me give you a little hint for this uh, for this this problem. It will suffice. The big the big the big thrust of this problem is show that R is isomorphic to two copies of R, right? If you can do that, then you've got it made because now you just apply induction. Because if R is isomorphic to two copies of R, well, these two one of these copies of R is isomorphic to two copies, so now you've got three copies and so forth. So on. So the heavy lifting is only going to be showing that R is isomorphic to two copies of R. So uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of a fun one. So see if you can puzzle over that. You'll have to pick your functions kind of uh, uh, cleverly. Okay, so uh, this is something that we're going to define very soon, maybe today, maybe not. Um, uh, but I've got it written in red. Uh, we say that the following diagram of R modules with the top row exact. Like top row exact here just means one thing. G is one to one, right? Um, so you have A to B is one to one. You've got some random R module homomorphism A down to I. Uh, we say that I is injective if given that diagram, there's an R module homomorphism uh, H from B to I, such that when you do um, G then H, it's the same thing as F. Uh, such a module is called an injective module, right? But we're going to talk about projectives and injectives later. Show that the following conditions on an R module I are equivalent. 
And you may use this without proof. For the time being, you may assume uh, that any R module can be embedded into an injective R module. So if you've got any module, you can put it inside uh, a perhaps larger injective R module. Show the following conditions are equivalent. I is ejective uh, as per the definition in red. Every short exact sequence of this form where I is at the left end actually is split exact. And number three, if R is a submodule of the R module B, then I is a direct sum into B. So in other words, if I is contained inside B, then you can write B as I sum J for some other submodule J. Yeah. Any questions on that? Okay, well, hopefully that will uh, be some fun for it. Let me turn this off here. Uh, while I'm thinking about it, of course, uh, there will be uh, a math club today, Freeman Slaughter, who is one of your own, will be speaking. He's a really great speaker, and it'll be about uh, clever trip grandmas. I highly recommend uh, Freeman's talks. So anyway, uh, think about doing that this afternoon at five. Okay, so the last time we were talking about this result, I've kind of got it abbreviated here, uh, this business about the split exact sequences, there exists an H. Uh, from C to B, such that this composition is the identity on C. There is a K uh, from B to A, such that this composition is the identity on A. And finally, uh, the sequence is isomorphic to uh, this uh, obvious split exact sequence here. Um, last time we showed one implies two and two implies three. So let's finish this off. Uh, So let's do three implies one. So suppose that the sequence is isomorphic here. So uh, let me kind of draw a picture of the situation. Now, our assumption is the, sequ the sequence is isomorphic to this. So what this means, this is inclusion into A. Um, and what this uh, does is this takes the element A to A comma zero, right? And this is convection on the C, which means it reads the element A comma C and just tells me what the C port is, right? It's the identity on A, it's the identity on C, and this is pitch four, which is a nice morphous. Now, uh, let's see, what are we trying to do? We're trying to do number one. So we want to get a function from C to B uh, such that G A equals one C, right? Okay, how do we do this? Uh, what do we call it? H. Um, any ideas? So I, I, I've got to start. I've got to start with something in C, and I've got to make it go back here to B somehow. How might I do this? So what I would do, of course, this is the identity. So I, I can just think of this as kind of mashed into one thing, right? So if I have a C here, what is the most obvious way to get back uh, here? C. Right. So let's go. I'm going to call that out a C, right? Which goes to C like C, right? Yes. And then if I want to get to B, I'll just go up here with old pitchfork inverse. And Pitchfork inverse is, in fact, in our module homomorphism. We proved that in an earlier homework. So we're going to define. This is this is what I'm thinking here. I'm defining uh, H from C to B via 
H of C is inclusion uh, and then pitchfork inverse. And that gets me something in B. Everybody okay with that? Now I'm going to do is check it. So let's check it. Um, Well, notice that G H C is G of C. Uh, right, but how are we going to get out of this? Let's look at this diagram here. Notice that this diagram here, just this part of the diagram, or oh, that doesn't include Mr. A here. This part of the diagram I can use, right? Which means that when I do G and then the identity of C, this is the same thing as when I do pitchfork and I C. Agree? Mm -hmm. Which means the G equals pi C H four. So combined with this knowledge here, replace G by pi C H four, and then I have H four inverse. Now, of course, these two cancel to the identity, right? And this is pi c of zero c, which is c. And so when I do h and then I do g, I get the identity. And that completes the proof. Any questions on that? Questions? Okay. Now we're going to talk about something like uh, free modules. Uh, how many of you have heard of this? Free modules. Well, free modules uh, when Matt taught 8510, I bet he might have talked about free groups, <laughs> maybe free abelian groups as well, right? Uh, these are free objects. They're kind of these universal objects in a category. We're not going to go into that here. But free modules are sort of the grandparent of all modules in a certain sense, because what we're going to discover is free modules. I'm sorry about that. What we're going to discover is that free modules are um, every every R module is the homomorphic image of a free module, and in a certain sense, free modules are maybe the easiest module uh, over a ring that you can comprehend because free modules. Are the ones that have a basis. These are the, the modules that are basically the generalization of vector spaces. They best mimic a vector space. They have something called a basis. They're almost as good as a basis, but not. Uh, they're almost as good as a, 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 a basis for free module. Makes free modules almost as good as a vector space, but you're missing a couple of things because a free module is basically a vector space over a ring. Uh, but it's not really a vector space because we're going to see that there's a couple of important things that are missing. Uh, however, for the most part, it works out uh, really well for us. Um, also, it's going to turn out that we're going to see that free modules, free modules are determined only by their rank, right? So if I walk up to, to you on the street and I tell you my ring, and I tell you the rank of the free module, then you know it up to isomorphism, which is another very important property. So it's kind of cool that they're the easiest, but they're also sort of the grandparent of every other R module. So let's start off with something that's probably um, a familiar notion 
definition six by one. Um, a subset of an R module M uh, is said to be linearly independent uh, if given. X1, X2, XA, and X, uh, the relation let me say any for clarity of given any co a finite collection, uh, finite subset of elements of X, the relation R1X1 plus R2X2 plus RAXA is equal to zero uh, for Ri in R implies R1 equals R2 equals Ra. So a set of elements in a module uh, is linearly independent uh, if a linear combination of any finite subset being zero means that all the coefficients, all the RIs have to be um, Let me remark that if you have a set is either linearly independent or it's not. And if it's not, we say it's linearly dependent, right? What a shocker on terminology there. Um, let me also say, um, If uh, a subset you know spans, you know, that is, and let me make this precise, every element of M is a finite. Linear combination of uh, some elements of X uh, looking up the next there. A subset spans M uh, here. It generates M, and that is every element of M is a finite linear combination of elements of M. Um, if uh, M is an R module, span by a linearly independent set. X, then X is a basis. So, just like in linear algebra, just like in linear algebra, what a basis is for an R module is it's a linearly independent subset that spans it. Now, there's a big theorem in linear algebra. That says if you have any vector space, it has a basis, right? By the way, <laughs> so here's here's something just to make you angry. Well, uh, zero is a vector space. What's the basis for zero? What's that? It's the empty set, right? It's tempting to say, well, it's generated by zero, but zero is sort of not a linearly independent set, right? Because one times zero is zero, and that violates linear independence. Uh, the zero, the zero vector space, is actually expanded by the empty set. So um, let me point out that if I come up to you on the street with an R module 
it's likely to not have a basis. It's not every module is going to have a basis. So let me give you an example. Uh, so the Z module Z, um, one is a basis. One is a linearly independent set. Z is model itself. Four, C module. Uh, C sum Z. Anybody guess what a basis for this might be? Yeah, that's, that sounds like a pretty intelligent guess. And in fact, that is correct. It's, it's, Pretty easy to check that this is a basis because if you have a times this plus b times this and equals zero zero, that forces a and b to both be zero, right? And a typical element of z sum z is form a sum b, which is b times this plus a times this, right? So there's uh, those two have a basis. Um, or the module. Uh, two Z. You might give me a basis for that. Two is basis, right? Because everything in here is an integer times two. Right, and two itself is linearly independent because two times n equals zero means n has to be zero. Right? Uh, let me point out one of the things that's different. There's a theorem. So let me see if y'all remember this one. Um, there's a theorem from uh, vector space theory that, or from, from linear algebra, that says if you have uh, a subspace. In the larger vector space B, right? And suppose I have a basis for you, let's call this X, a basis. Does anybody, can anybody guess where I'm going? You can extend it to a basis for B. You can extend it to a basis for B, right? Y'all remember this, right? So everything in, in U is a linear combination. What's in that set X? Uh, and if I can make that, that set that basis grow to a basis the larger by putting in there other things, right? This is not true here. So notice that two Z, Z are Z modules. Right? Now, notice that the basis here is two, and there's no way to make this grow to a basis for Z, right? Two itself does not work as a basis for Z because when it, what's, what's spanned by two is only multiples of two, and so you don't get anything odd, right? So to expand this to a basis, you'd have to throw in some odd number and two, right? And this is not linearly independent anymore because two times the odd minus two times the odd is zero, right? So this set right here is not linearly independent, no matter what odd you pick, right? So this is one thing that's going to be different in general is that you can't expand this to the basis. Notice that part of the problem here is two is not invertible. That's why it doesn't span all of Z because you've got this pesky problem that everything in the span of this is multiplied by, multiplied by two. If you were in a field, this would not be a problem because you just divide out by it, right? Here's another example. Uh, Q uh, has no Z basis. Uh, can anybody explain why? It 
So Q is certainly a Z module, right? Because it's an abelian group, right? But I claim that there is no subset of Q that generates. Well, first of all, let me point out. Point. If X in Q is linearly independent, then anybody draw the conclusion here? That is correct. And of course, if it's got zero, it's a CMT set. I'm going to ignore that. But so the only interesting subsets of Q that are linearly independent only have one element in them. It wouldn't be true that there's more. Yeah. I uh, consider two arbitrary, uh, and in fact, I, I, I guess I want more than that. Uh, in fact, let me do it this way. Uh, without loss of generality, let's say A over B, C over B. Consider two different elements, and in fact, suppose. Um, well, actually, that might, I don't suppose that. Uh, the reason I can put this in this form is if I take two fractions, I can certainly put them over a common denominator, right? By okay with that. Now, suppose these two are distinct elements here. Let me point out that there's no way that these two elements can be linearly independent if they're distinct because notice that uh, C times A over B uh, plus negative a of c over b is equal to zero. So there's your problem. Right? So the only way that q can have a basis is if there's only one element, right? right? So now suppose that our basis is a over b. Uh, there's no way this generates the whole rationals because if it spans Q, then there exists N and Z uh, such that N times A over B is equal to one over two B. Right. And that's going to be a problem for you because this means that, and this is a contradiction because you can't multiply two integers and get one half. So this is an example of a Z module, mainly Q is an example of Z module, uh, that has no basis. Let me give you another Z module that has no basis. Uh, actually, let me generalize this. The origin of billion systems. C module. Then A has no basis. Uh, by the way, do you know what I mean when I say torsion ability group? I mean, it could be infinite, but it means that every element has phi order. Right. So, for example, if you take the direct product of Z2 uh, infinitely many times, that's an example of a torsion element. It's got a whole lot of 
elements in it, but every element is order two or one, right? So torsion just means every element's finite order. Not only does A have no basis, it has no non empty linearly independent set. In fact, every non empty set. Is linearly dependent. And I'll prove this for you. So suppose A is in A. We know the order of A is equal to N, right? Therefore, in A equals zero uh, with A with N not zero. So there isn't even a single element that by itself is linearly independent. So no way uh, do you ever have a basis here. Any questions on that? Okay, so let me give you, so now that I've uh, sort of <laughs> saturated with you with a few examples, uh, and in fact, notice that all my examples were Z models. Right. So even in the Z module case, uh, which is sort of the easiest case of modules in our vector spaces, uh, there's a lot of variety. Okay, so let me give you the following theorem here. This is kind of our, our central theorem, if you will, concerning uh, pre-modules. Uh, theorem. Um, let R be a ring with identity, F a unitary R module. Following the meet our equivalent, and F is sort of for free. Uh, a, F has a non-empty basis actually throw in basis that's what all you need uh f is the internal direct sum of the family of r modules I should have said some of here. The direct sum of a family of R submodules, each of which, which is isomorphic to R as an R module. So that means that we can find this family of submodules of F, each of which is isomorphic to R, such that F is the internal direct sum of this. C, F is an R module, uh, F is R module isomorphic to a direct sum of some number of copies of the R module R. A direct sum of some number of copies of the R module R. Uh, that is to say, F is more than direct sum R, some index set. And D, so here's kind of my, there, just like with direct sum and direct product, there's this notion of like uh, the, this free object is actually um, a solution to this universal mapping problem in the following sense. D, uh, there exists a non empty set function.
Uh, by the way, it's it's a good idea to sort of, if you're trying to picture something in your mind, to think of X as the basis or the set as the basis of F, uh, such that given any unitary R model M, And function, not homomorphism, not isomorphism, not anything fancy, just a function from X to M. Then there exists an R module homomorphism uh, unique from F to M. There exists a unique R module homomorphism F bar from F to M uh, such that F bar out of this function down. So let me draw you a diagram for this, as I like to do with these kinds of things here. Um, Here's my set X, and here is my module F. And I like to think of this as sort of uh, the inclusion, if you will, from the basis. I think this is the basis into F. Now, here's your little innocent R module M standing over here. And this is a function. What that, what this thing about, uh, free module says is this induces this takes this ordinary garden variety function and turns it in to an R module homomorphism if you expand it linearly. Right? So function arises from the function arises an R module homomorphism. Right? This is and there's a unique, it's unique determined by F, such as the diagram for me is when you do uh, iota and then F bar, it's the same thing as the original function. Now, this is something, uh, although it, it may not jump at you, out at you immediately, this is something that's probably familiar from linear algebra in the following sense. Um, one of the big things that you learned in linear algebra when you started trying to represent linear transformations as matrices, right? Y'all remember doing that way back in the day, right? One of the things you probably discovered, uh, maybe your teacher pointed out, or maybe it's a theorem, or maybe you kind of figured it out on your own, is how do you determine a linear transformation? All you got to do is tell the basis elements where to go. If you're doing a linear transformation from R5 to R3, all you do is you list whatever your favorite basis of R5 is, and you look at each one of those vectors, V1 up to V5, and you tell, you go here, you go here, you go, like that. And once you tell those basis vectors where to go, that determines the entire transformation, right? That's, uh, that's basically the content of this, right? This function is you telling the basis vectors where to go. And you can turn that instruction into an R module from expanding linear. This is really the content. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so let's go through at least part of this proof. I'm gonna skip some of it, like I, I may skip the connection between B and C uh, because they're pretty straightforward to show. Uh, but let's do some of it anyway. Uh, let's do A implies B. Do a plus b. So what do we have? We've got a non-empty basis. And so now we want to show that it's the internal direct sum, of a family of some cyclic R modules. Um, so let's let x be the basis. Uh, let's 
So let's let X be our basis for F. Um, and let me point out that if you have an element of X, Um, and let me point out the importance of linear independence here. Let me point that R is isomorphic to Rx. Uh, the way this function works, uh, let me take a little aside here, is uh, we'll call this theme. It's the R equals Rx, right? No surprises here, right? Um, notice that this is clearly on to. But I'll skip the fact that this is an R module homomorphism because it's um, pretty straightforward, right? Uh, notice that this is clearly on to because everything over here is in the form of little R times X. So I've got her covered, right? Um, why is it one to one? Okay. This is an R module epimorphism. And also, if Rx equals zero, this implies that R is zero. And the reason is, is X is an element of a linearly independent set. So X by itself in the raw is also a linearly independent element, which means that R times X by itself equals zero means that R has to be zero. This is linearly independent. So this means that this is in fact an R module isomorphism. So R and RX are uh, essentially the same. Um, also, let's note that F expands F, capital F. So it is the case. Uh, this must be the case here. Because let me point out, let me remember, uh, let me remind you here that the sum is taken over x and x over rx, and so a typical element of this looks like the sum x and x r sub x times x. Right. However, almost every uh, rx is equal to zero. Right. We're we demand that because when we talk about a span, we we only use finite in many of these at a time. Again, that's our, our nice co uh, connection with the rest of Everybody okay with that? So in particular, what we have is every element of F can be expressed as a finite linear combination of elements from X, right? So what we have at this point, what we're going for is R is the internal direct sum of these submodules of Rx. Here's where we are. R is the sum of the direct. We need to know that the sum is direct, right? And fortunately, we, we've already kind of covered a way to, to deal with that. So let's do this. Uh, no. The sum is direct, right? And so um, to this end, suppose M uh, is an element of Rx and the sum Y and X, Y R Y. Suppose you have an element that is in Rx 
And it's also in what's generated by all the Y's that are not X. Our goal is, we're going to know this is direct if I can prove that M is zero. Everybody agree with that? Okay, so let's see what we can do to that end. This means that M, well, let me, uh, M is equal to R X. If R equals zero, then done. Because then, if R is zero, that means M is zero, which is what we wanted to prove, right? So, assume R is not zero, right? Also, uh, M is equal to, uh, there's some subset of this, uh, R1, Y1, uh, plus R2, Y2, plus R, K, Y, K, where each Y, I is in um, our elements of the basis that are not X. Right. Well, what does this mean? This means that Rx is equal to R1Y1 plus R2Y2 plus RKYK, or equivalently, zero is negative Rx plus R1Y1 plus RKYK. And of course, X is not any of these Y's, right? And I actually can assume all the Y's are distinct as well. Uh, so R equals zero equals R1 equals R2 equals RK as X is linearly independent. Because here you have a relation of linear combination equaling zero, therefore, M equals zero, and so F is the end. It's this. It's the internal correct sum of those Rx's, all of which are isomorphic to R. Um, okay, so uh, any questions on that? I will leave uh, B and C to you all because internal direct sum is obviously this thing is obviously isomorphic to the direct sum of R uh, over the same index set, the same size index set, right? Because each of those R axes is isomorphic to um, R. Let's at least get a start on C implies D. Uh, so F is isomorphic to the direct sum of R I times some index set uh, with each. Uh, R I isomorphic isomorphic R as an R module uh, via let's see I need the notation of this B I goes from R I to R. This is the set of isomorphism that we want to use. Uh, so for each I, we have the following commutative diagram. All I, we have over here. R I R. This is my pre I, and I have R I going into the direct. Actually, 
put this uh, let's do this very that's that this is including the I the I coordinate um now so we've got this property here and by the universal mapping property of the direct sum we get this map right here um now define uh each x well actually i'm gonna leave that right here for now so see if you guys can anticipate where i'm going so we've got this set up here and of course what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to that final business about the community diagram here the existence of this white kind of shady map here is because of the universal mapping problem Property. See if y'all can figure out how to bootstrap that up. And if you can't, well, no worries because you got me Monday. I am sorry that I've got to uh, uh, take off back to class today uh, and fix my water heater. Uh, however, I'm going to go home and uh, I plan to get on Zoom. I might be in and out with the guy that's, help, uh, that's fixing it for me. Uh, so if you try to go to Zoom, you can't get a hold of me. Just use my cell or send me an email or something and I'll, I'll get to you as quick as I can. Uh, if any of you think that you've got a hard time finishing up the homework, just let me know after class and it can be extended. That's fine. Any questions? I will be back this afternoon for Freeman's talk, and I highly recommend it. So I uh, hope y'all are there, and otherwise, have a good weekend. <laughs>